Welcome everyone to Cloud Computing and Big Data. Um, today we have our lecture five on MapReduce computing paradigms. So this is a very broad topic, um, basically also complementing some of the aspects we have heard before when we talked about Spark. In Spark, we left out the data side a little bit, right? We were focusing on in-memory computing. That's where Spark is good. But today we also complement a little bit more on the data side. So why MapReduce is so powerful, what is the concept of data locality, which is really something we exploit here today so that you don't ship around petabytes. So this will be something for the lecture today, but let us review a little bit what we had the last time. And the last time was really talking about how we create data centers. Um, needless to say, virtualization is a Z term that you need there. It's a basis why cloud computing at all is existing and basically how it really became so successful. And you see basically the contrast between the different two key approaches you would have these days where you have, let's say, plain hardware. Sometimes we say bare metal hardware here, uh, where you refer to really physical hardware that existing somewhere. And then you would have a host operating system, can be Linux, can be Windows Server, Windows, whatever. And then you have your applications in that. So the concept of virtualization is basically then to introduce a so-called abstraction layer called VMM hypervisor, there are different words for it. You still, of course, have the physical hardware. It's not disappearing, you have that. But the benefit is you create so-called multiple logical or virtual hardware out of it. Of course, in the end, when you ask the guest operating system to do a storage, of course, the storage will in the end end on a physical device, right? Also for memory, you have the real memory used, but more or less, you have something where sharing is suddenly possible. And the sharing, resource sharing is one key idea that we leverage in the data center. As basically you see on a simple laptop here, we talked the last time about it, it could be that basically the host operating system is Linux, but then you put, let's say, li different Linux derivatives here, part of the virtual machines and can work with all of them. Obviously for up some applications that would make sense, for instance, some coding when you're a Windows guy, but then for some coding, you rather prefer the Linux environment. That could be one example. Of course, this is a simplest way how you can look at virtualization. Now, what we're interested in, in big data, and of course, in our course, how we scale up, right? And scaling up was something which enables us a so-called economics of scale, very important term, economics of scale something you need to learn by heart and will be definitely in the exam coming, right? So you have to learn that. And we have looked in several examples the last time, right? The Google data center was 11 times the soccer field. That's economics of scale. The operating cost for that running is much, much cheaper than having many, many, many different small data centers. And that has lots of um, facets to it. One is the interesting infrastructure. So you have this kind of gas for basically getting out the fires. You have seen about the water cooling, whereby, of course, <clears throat> there could be different air coolings, water coolings, immersive cooling, as I was alluding to the last time. There are many ideas how you do it, but still the infrastructure, for instance, is, of course, very crucial to us. Also, you have seen basically the racks that you see here in the data center much more streamlined, pressed together. It's not like just putting a few PCs or laptops together via a network. Here we have really highly organized racks. We come to this principle again later on. Now, when you would say one rack is just dedicated for Spark, another dedicated for Hadoop, another one for that application, you miss a chance of doing resource sharing, basically. So that means when someone is not using the mass Spark, all the physical cluster would essentially be idle. Idle is a very bad word in computing. We always in the centers want to have 99.9 .9 availability, usability, that's something where we never will achieve 100%. I tell, tell you also today why, because we have lots of faults. But the idea is, of course, to leverage the hardware as much as you can, because it's very costly. And by allowing now this virtual clusters that you basically cover with a virtual cluster, more than one physical one, or you can at least reuse parts of the physical cluster again for another application is now the idea of this resource sharing. And virtualization makes us really nicely applicable. Here's a good example where you have then really physical clusters, which could be racks here within basically this data center as an example. But then the real way how you use it would be a virtual cluster spanning, for instance, different physical clusters, which you define of could be an Apache Spark cluster running, right? Then of course you would have maybe another Hadoop cluster. You would have then basically another application of sort. 
This is, of course, a field now where you would do highly specialized um, deployment, basically, within the physical structure. Now, <clears throat> virtualization, of course, um, gives you many benefits, not only, let's say, on the small laptop scale, also the data center scale. Particularly, we looked in one of the key themes, which is live migration, right? As I said earlier, we have to, and as you see basically also in the Google uh, movie last time, right? Failure is always in the hardware. Every day, 24-7, there's always failures in all of these because you have so many millions of cores, right? And on top of it, it's very dense, which creates a lot, a lot of heat. And CPUs and storage here and there is quite sensitive to heat. So it means we have lots of overheating, chips break, and then they have to be exchanged. By live migrate, the workload then to another part of the cluster, you basically can get rid of the faults and stay operational, which would be also reviewed today with using Hadoop and MapReduce because it's exactly good for this kind of work. So this helps you when, let's say, one rack gets out uh, for overheating. Of course, in the end, the data center will repair it. But the point is you have a running application, maybe running Spark, a job for already for 24 hours. And because of the rack is basically failing, you don't want to start again and run the job again 24 hours. So it gets live migrated to another one that still works while then the technician can use its roller or basically the scooter to repair it at some point in time. So this is something which is really the breakthrough of clouds. Um, we say also today hyperscalers, uh, basically Google, Amazon, MS Azure, all of these are called hyperscalers, mostly because they employ many, many, many soccer fields, right? Of physical servers. When you look inside that, it's not at all that this is one server, right? There's very many virtualized clusters and servers that you a little bit see alluded here today. Um, finally, we of course looked on the costs. If you think about there's lots of logical hardware. Here you see the virtualization management gap, which is quite nice for us because it enables us the resource sharing because it's virtualized. We can always add more users. We can add more clusters. And the, when one is not needed, we can shut it down, get another one on. Of course, then the physical cluster is really utilized to almost 100%. And that is what we want to achieve. And with this, you save a lot of cost, right? Otherwise, you would like pull down uh, lots of physical clusters, which are never used. You lost a lot of money. You have heard from one of the students last time, you know, every five, six years in their data center, they have to renew the hardware, right? Also something to see. Um, and with this virtualization, you can realize this much, much more quicker, transparent to the users. They will not even really realize that for sure. Then um, this resource sharing was one of the construct where it's here, let's say, a little bit as an example with research, with research group members here. And of course, this means this all this data center is just one part of one big node. Of course, there are many different computing centers interconnected, right? That's what you heard from Google. Also, there's just one. And when there's one big fail, there's also operational capacity to really, let's say, shift via then more storage and networking aspects to other data centers easier. And that's what Google does. And that's where Google quite good is. That's why we had also the interesting movie last time. So again, economics of scale is important. Scaling up the resources and this enables of course application scaling workload scaling lots of different scaling down the road so today we have a very more practical topic coming um, as i said i will also give you some uh, demonstration which will be then related to your assignment too and you see basically deep learning and deep learning applications is also coming which will be then related to your assignment three so we put this stuff which is related to your assignment very early so that you can start early in the course solving the assignments and don't have the exam trouble at the end. So this is very important. <clears throat> Still, today we really look at MapReduce more from the conceptual perspective. As I was saying, there will be practical lecture 5.1. There will be also practical lectures 6.1 and 7.1 showing you more deep learning applied, right? But today we have a conceptual part of the MapReduce part, but with a practical lecture next time, you get much more insights how it's really used in the cloud. So the MapReduce approach, um, especially if you compare to high performance computing, the other course we're teaching basically in this area is really derived from a complete different way. It's basically think about big data analytics. So there's big data accumulated in centers like a Facebook center growing and growing, and you want to do some analytics on it, some analysis of the data, maybe some machine learning models. And this is something where basically then MapReduce had their origin. Needless to say, who was the first who did MapReduce? 
Google, of course, right? When it's about big data, you see until today, Google has always nice papers of innovative material. This was 2004, so kind of 20 years ago, but still it has relevance until today, right? So many of these facets are of course something which Google faced the first. Today you would say maybe even uh, Facebook and others, YouTube, but it's already a Google company. So in this sense, um, this is something where they really learned um, how to work with big data. That also doesn't mean that they do everything with MapReduce. We will see today that this is a paradigm for a couple of good things, indexing and so on. And then maybe you combine this with a graph database, which we have later in the course, right? So MapReduce is also not there to say it solves all problems of big data, right? Especially if you have, let's say, highly interconnected data that we have in graphs and graph neural networks or graph networks are much better that we will introduce later. So <clears throat> in the end, what you should also take away from this is that MapReduce is basically a wrong term that I usually teach. Um, you would say it suggests a little bit that there's just a map and a reduce phase, which is true, but there's a very strong phase in the middle that makes it so successful called sort, shuffle, and grouping. That's also what we discussed today. So it's not really map reduce, it's called map, sort, shuffle, group, reduce. And this is an important part. So the framework helping there with a the key value structure inherently in the framework is already a very big win. That is also key to understand really the map reduce approach better. Of course, this is related to key value stores. I mean, some probably have also heard about this. No SQL stores, maybe we use this. It's like the opposite of SQL, where you basically have really things. Okay, we will have also there later on some examples and also in the practical lecture where you have just basically not a kind of column for every little basically person or so. Instead, you really have, let's say, just the content per person stored, the age, the email, and another one, you have a name and the telephone number, and you don't have this SQL-like table structure, basically. No SQL is basically that works quite good with the key value structures from MapReduce. That's why I'm mentioning it. And of course, HBase and others are basically there that work nicely with it. Also, and when I, of course, teach that here in the cloud course, you can imagine it's deployed everywhere. Basically, you find this in Amazon. We do the examples in Amazon. But MS Azure, of course, as we have seen, has also already an idea how to do basically an MS Azure cluster deployment on Hadoop. Hadoop is the implementation of MapReduce as we will learn today. And with this, you have it in all clouds, basically also available, also in Google. So this is nice, very, let's say, broadly adopted. Um, and what it even make it more successful is the ecosystem around it. We will have a look in the second part then, that basically you can combine now this Hadoop with a hell of a lot of other things and lots of scripting databases and databases. And we will have a whole ecosystem as we will call it, where you can combine MapReduce and the Hadoop implementation then with Apache Spark, for instance. It's one of the examples, but there are many others also. If you then come to the real good deployment at the end, um, how you do this professionally these days, we will already have a sneak preview to containers. If you have, let's say, lots of Spark workers, lots of basically Hadoop MapReduce workers and also the head nodes, you can easily deploy them these days with Docker containers and using Kubernetes basically for steering all of them. Um, this is something which we will have in later topics, how we actually manage such a big crowd of systems. Here we focus now for your assignment on some practicalities, how you use it. And then of course, the OpenStack cloud operating system. If the boss comes to you and say, I want a map reduce cluster tomorrow, build it for me, here's some money. You would take OpenStack and it has all the building blocks also very nicely already prepared of building your own map reduce cluster uh, down basically in your cellar. So in one respect, also we complement, as you see on the right-hand side, these are my promises from the last lectures a little bit more of the data side of things. I was saying we were focused on a lot of compute. Now we basically have a much more also looked at in the data side. So let's come to the Mac, uh, MapReduce approach. Big data analytics was basically one of the deriving aspects why basically that came into existence. And when you think about data analytics versus data analysis, this is something where people have, let's say, always overlaps and are not completely sure. And to be honest, there's not really a very good definition differentiating both. You would say you still do some data analysis um, when you do some analytics, although analytics is often more basically faster based on correlations rather than looking really very, very deep in the data. However, you would combine both when you, for instance, do a Spark cluster and then in the end some machine learning where you have a really causality maybe behind it 
although um, it's different from physical understanding, different from really doing detailed data analysis where you have the causality. One famous example, and we have some Germans here, is Hamburg, and basically the, the birds that give the babies, right? So they bring the babies. There's a highly correlation that it's more birds, more babies, but we also know it's actually not true, right? So they don't bring the babies. But this is one idea where big data analytics will do it, and very successful can do it very quick, and we have some other examples also on that later. But this is different from, let's say, the things we teach in high performance computing. So it's not coming from the community doing weather forecasts, doing you know disaster control, and, and many of these, let's say, physical simulations based on known um, you know physical laws, numerical methods, which is really highly intertwined and requires high performance computing. Here we think a little rather lots of data exists, and that brings us also to the overlap with machine learning. But, but basically here, data is the main paradigm. So we have a lot of data. You can imagine when you have already Google as an example, I know still Google from the beta time was already then very good search engine. And of course you think about they sitting on data and it's just growing a pot of data with all the web links, all the web links. We had the page rank as an example, but basically the web is growing, the content is growing. And this is what you do as Google, then you want to work on the data. <laughs> Needless to say, we have also seen basically some of the aspects are not so highly intertwined. We do weather forecasts and you do it here around basically our area in 101. It has natural effect on 102, 103, 104 here in Reykjavik, right? Because it's very close to each other. Here, here are some parts of the web which actually are not connected. So you can nicely deparalyze this basically and can do this in a high throughput fashion. And this is the idea then where basically this kind of algorithms come into play with MapReduce. Um, which is derived from something called divide and conquer that many previous from you already know, perhaps. Who knows divide and conquer? It's 101 computer science. Almost all should raise their hand. Or we have to change something in Howe here. So that's really a, a key paradigm. Um, in order to do so, as I said also, there was an idea that maybe then always it needs to be not cutting edge computing, right? When you talk here about high performance computers that you see here, the supercomputers, they have one thing in common, and this is a highly Per performant interconnect cut of infinity bands, for instance. And that makes it very, very costly. This is required for weather forecast because the core should all contact each other, should all talk to each other very much, right? So it's a very costly interconnect while basically many of the clouds rather use, let's say, um, off the shelf components that you see a little bit here. Here, sometimes the idea is not just using infinity band or very specialized interconnects, rather just basically Ethernet, which is still good for many applications, right? InfiniBand is just extremely, extremely good. But there you go and would pay the price for it from the supercomputers today, you would say one third as a rule of thumb again is again the network cost. It's not the cores, not the GPUs. It's the network cost of this InfiniBand, all the interconnects between all the cores. And the analytics would run on something which is not that because basically we have lots of tasks which don't need the communication. Right, we can do tasks in parallel, hence divide, right? And then in the end, you conquer together again. You can do things in parallel. And this is more where this comes from. Hence, you will find in some of the clouds also not the support for InfiniBand. Today, you will find, of course, some HPC clusters that you can use also InfiniBand connected in the cloud, but it's still not a supercomputer like, for instance, we have in Jülich, Barcelona, which has then millions of cores and so forth. So basically, that brings us back to the discussion we already had. Uh, you remember that was one of my first lectures, really. Um, what is high performance computing? What is high throughput computing? Um, rather, this data analytics, what we have here today as a topic in MapReduce, would rather be OK to run on HTC, right? So the, where the network connection is actually not so important, rather data throughput would be much more important than having here a very good interconnect on a, let's say, millisecond basis with weather forecasters or always exchanging the parameters to do a good job. And this is something where um, basically the idea also comes from making it simpler. So some of you have actually heard my HPC course, right? I think somewhere, not, not here, but in this. But when you go there, you will see it's basically relatively harder to use, not swiping a credit card. You basically have to think about distributed memory, shared memory, programming it. Um, it's not at all like just clicking Jupiter and then everything looks beautiful and, and so on. Usually you have to think about parallel 
interconnect, that means parallel messaging. You have something called the message passing interface, MPI, right? That's, this two program is quite complex. You have to have the different architectures that you see here with a distributed memory architecture, combined maybe even then with a shared memory architecture in each of the node, making it hybrid, so that you have to program distributed memory and shared memory. When you do this, you have a data side of things, right? When you do weather forecasts, obviously you would probably um, take the world and put it into smaller blocks, but there are so several problems that you want to have maybe in cyclic fashion solved. Long story short, lots of complexity in parallelization, right? And the HPC course, we will teach that a little bit uh, where you can then also see uh, essentially this when you join this course, of course, um, you would say this is something what not everybody needs on this granularity level. So you would also say um, you have something like scientists that just want to use it, users that don't want to have all of this tough complexity, right? So what about those that want to have just analyze data basically and to keep it relatively small and stupid and easy to use? So don't think about at all how it is paralyzed, basically. And this is the idea then which contributed also to the success of MapReduce. It was very simple, just program a map, program a reduce, and leverage the key structure. So no MPI send receive broadcasts and collectives and what we teach in the HPC course. So that's much more simpler to program. And then also, of course, with lots of implementations being already there. Um, Intended in that, the basically cloud systems were growing a lot. With this, as I said to you also, the failures were growing significantly, right? Having now 11 um, soccer field HP uh, system basically from the Google data center means failure all along the way. And even here in our supercomputer, you see a little bit how much we have here roughly in cores and basically in, in terms of um, nodes, right? When you multiply this, also here, it's a relatively for science standards, good system, but for Google data centers, of course, in a way, a smaller system, but also there already hardware fails constantly. So to mitigate this, the idea was to deal with failures along the way. And that's what produce also was basically uh, making it so successful. It had a high resiliency. So when you do now an MPI job on a supercomputer with weather forecast, one thing fails, one core is overheated, you have to start the whole weather forecast from scratch again. And those sometimes run over three, four days, right? So you lose all the computing time you've done. So the idea was working on data then was of course much more flexible. When something breaks, you just look again on the data. Even if others have proceeded, you don't care because it's embarrassingly parallel as we call, right? You can process data in parallel. You may be interested in a summary statistic in the end about everything, right? So, but this is something where maybe you can have much more resiliency, which was then feeding into MapReduce as well. So this was really something which are all the key ingredients, how MapReduce, the idea was grown basically by Google to actually do this. And then along the way, we had also the idea, of course, that this data was always growing and it became incapable of just sending it around, right? We had bought just a newly, another 20 petabytes because we just almost cope not anymore with the growing of data. The same for Google, now getting the who Google tender sent to HPC machine for doing some data analysis and back is infeasible, basically, right? It's too much. You probably put all on storage and put it in a truck. The bandwidth would be much better for petabytes of data. Hence, the idea of MapReduce was also having something like data locality, having smaller jobs, hence map jobs and reduce jobs rather bring to the data, operated there in small scale, and then go away again for the basically conquer step, right? And basically this was another part of it. So it's also different how MPI operates. You ship the whole data there, you work on it, and then basically ship the data back, right? Complete different philosophy. And of course, this was more needed as Facebook and others are actually significantly growing. So that brings us to Hadoop. Now, basically to a bit more constant thinking what no map reduce is, uh, implementations in Spark as well. But here we focus a bit on Hadoop, which was the first real implementation of MapReduce and the beautiful aspect of it is, it is um, essentially an open source tool that everybody can use, adopt for the company. And that is what people have done. They have created a huge ecosystem around Hadoop. We will look in the second course hours later, which again is another success factor of Hadoop. And today, many of these actually transform to Hadoop. 
as you know, still Hadoop is feasible because if you don't have the hardware, with all the different gigabytes of memory to employ, which can be costly in Apache Spark, then basically you have not really the performance that you see here. Well, then basically Spark outperforms Hadoop significantly because in the end, this is also largely drawn from in memory. And if you don't have in memory resources, Hadoop might be still a very good candidate for you, right? So basically both are data analytics processing engines. Both are really relevant today. You have seen in MS Azure on one of my slides, I could create a Spark cluster or Hadoop cluster or several others. And these are basically the two main ones that you would think of today. So how it looks like, right? So MapReduce now should be something we look a bit more in detail. As I said, I give you more illustrative examples also as part of Practical Lecture 5.1. But in a way, it's very simple. You have input chunks of data, right? Think about lots of piles of data that you can process individually. So you don't have to process them, let's say with some interconnect, you don't have to know what's happening in the other jobs. You just have this map phase where you want to do something. And then you have an intermediate results. You mapped a certain intermediate results to some key value pairs, and they reorganizing this and grouping it by pairs in order to perform the reduce task. So it's a basically a two kind of function set but as I told you, the middle should be not underestimated. The middle, I mean here, the sorting, shuffle, and grouping by keys. This is something what the Hadoop framework already implemented. So all of that is taken away from you. Also, the interconnect here to the map task is taken away from you. Basically, it's also not something which you have to explicitly program, which helps us, of course, also a lot. It's also based on Java a lot. And as I said earlier, it's derived from the problem, worker, worker, result, in the other words, divide and conquer philosophy. You partition a problem very, very many and small, and then you combine it re again back to a result. And this is a problem, that's why it's one-on-one -on -one computer science that many, many applications can take and leverage on. And Google, as I said here in 2004, had then the idea of leveraging this principle with Hadoop and the implementation of this MapReduce engine. So the only thing you had to do as a developer is just providing a map task, providing a reduce task, and the rest is taken care of from the whole cluster, all the interconnects, all the communication, everything. It's a resiliency. One node goes down, it will submit to another node that is still active. So lots of these aspects have been there for bringing Hadoop then really as, as one of the open source technologies at that time. And as I was also alluding to, it's not only simple to program, it has this powerful group by keys functionality. And I provide you an application example shortly, and you have also a nice movie alongside it, that this is really the powerful part of the engine, right? Which you have to leverage, of course, in your individual map and reduce tasks. But in the end... Well, this video uses uh, a basic example to explain how MapReduce works. MapReduce is a two-phase paradigm for crunching large data sets in a distributed system. Suppose you want to make three sandwiches, an Italian, a turkey, and a ham sandwich. A list of the ingredients needed for each sandwich is gathered during the map phase, and the total amount for each ingredient is determined during the reduce phase. The database contains a JSON document for each sandwich that defines the ingredients for that sandwich. You want to build an index that emits the ingredient and its value for each document, and use SUM for the reduce. Here you can see the documents in the database listing the ingredients for each sandwich. Next, you can query this index to see the amount of each individual ingredient for each sandwich, and then query the index to determine how much of each ingredient you need to make the three sandwiches. Visit the Cloud Learning Center at ibm.biz. Yeah, it's a very funny video in the context. So in the end, you have seen it breaks down into smaller chunks, what is the, basically the bread is all about, salami and so on. Of course, there are different examples that you can think about, and one of the most famous is word count. Think about lots of lots of documents and you want to just count the number of words. And this is the idea where you basically have as a key of obviously the word key, right? So which word it is. And as a map task, it's very simple to make it fast, right? You want to do it fast. At the data, you just always increase by one, right? I found the I found the word, I found the word one, one, one. As it is a key structure, you always add just, okay, another word found, another word found, another word found, this one, this one, this one. 
Then in the reduce, of course, you're interested in the summary statistics, right? So how many were there finally from the word? So and this is where this sort shuffle reduce comes in. It automatically brings you all the keys together, the words that you have been maybe computed on thousand different notes. They all bring it together in the key structure, sort shuffle it, so that the reduce now can reduce this list of these different words. And what has the reduce to do? Not a big weather forecast in physics, but just plus one, plus one, plus one, plus one, plus one for all the occasions. That's why it's computationally feasible to put it close to the data, not having a very big high performance computer, still racks, of course, in smaller computers. And that what, what was making it feasible. Another view to see that is essentially this one, where you have here a good example, again, of this word count, where you get some stream maybe from Twitter in, you break, of course, this into different pieces, all the different strings and then you have lots of parallel map tasks that never communicate with each other they don't care i found foo one car one bar one whatever they find in terms once their simple task is just adding a one to a kind of index structure with the key of course this is important here the word then as i said sort shuffle group very important for map reduce right although you just program this and this the key structure will be then aggregated and this communication you don't care of, you don't have to program. Also, this is completely done by the MapReduce engine. And you basically have then this kind of index put together based on your smart key. And what Reduce just has to do is again, computational simple, add up all of those basically together. In high performance computing, you would actually program that explicitly and having a or reduced with some operator, et cetera, having the course address that you want to use. Here, the framework does basically everything for you. And things we already discussed, of course, you need a cluster with scheduling. You need basically the idea of really deploying that at scale, where some scheduler comes in that we already discussed, basically this um, yarn cluster that is available. And you see here some application examples, more will come in practical lecture 5.1 and also basically lecture 14 later. But you see here one example that Facebook uses it just for building an index in parallel, but uses many other databases, right? But of course, for this, it's nicely scalable. And we come back to this example again and again over time. So also there, think about it that, of course, Facebook is not only using MapReduce, but also MapReduce for certain things. Just a summarizing one um, video that I found useful because it also basically has Spark in the game because now you're confused why he's talking about Spark, suddenly about Hadoop. Just a short video before we close uh, with the first course hours. Companies are looking to extract more value from their data, but struggle to capture, store, and analyze all the data generated today. Data is growing exponentially, coming from new sources, is increasingly diverse, and needs to be securely accessed to be analyzed by different applications and lines of business. AWS can solve these challenges. Customers can put all of their data in a data lake and analyze it with their choice of open source distributed processing frameworks, like Apache Spark and Hadoop. By far, the most popular storage infrastructure for a data lake is Amazon S3. However, customers have found operating Spark and Hadoop difficult, expensive, and time-consuming. Traditionally, you had to purchase and integrate the hardware and install and manage the software, including constant upgrades. Various lines of business would often timeshare centralized cluster resources, leading to underutilization during idle periods and missed SLA during peak. As your data grows, the size of your infrastructure constantly grows. Because storage and compute are tied together, Increasing storage means scaling expensive compute requirements. Amazon EMR makes deploying Spark and Hadoop easy and cost-effective and decouples compute and storage, allowing both of them to grow independently, leading to better resource utilization. EMR allows you to store data in Amazon S3 and run compute as you need to process that data. You can launch an EMR cluster in minutes. You don't need to worry about node provisioning, cluster setup, Hadoop configuration, or cluster tuning. Once the processing is over, you can switch off your clusters. You can automatically resize clusters to accommodate peaks and scale them down without impacting your Amazon S3 data lake storage. You can also run multiple clusters in parallel, allowing each of them to share the same data set. Managing Spark and Hadoop is also easy with EMR. It monitors your cluster, retrying failed tasks and automatically replacing poorly performing instances. 
Using Amazon CloudWatch, you can collect and track metrics, logs and audits, set alarms, and automatically react to changes. Finally, Amazon EMR makes deploying Spark and Hadoop cost-effective. You pay a per-second rate only for the cluster resources you use. Customer support is available 24-7 on your normal AWS support bill at a fraction of what other commercial Spark and Hadoop vendors would charge. With spot pricing, you can lower your bill up to 90%. IDC recently found the ROI of EMR versus on-premises is 342% over five years. It's no wonder why there are more customers migrating their on-premises Hadoop and Spark deployments to Amazon EMR than ever before. Try Amazon EMR today. It's the fastest, easiest, and most cost-effective way to get started with Spark and Hadoop. All right, okay. So you know, already I'm not paid from Amazon, as you know, but they have very nice videos. We break here for 10 minutes, thank you. Uh, we will use both. It's basically just to have you exposed to different infrastructures. But good question. Um, but just like MS Azure is quite nice with the integration of Jupyter Notebooks for the Spark deployment, it had a good template mechanism. That's why I preferred that for this. But basically, you can do the same with EMR, essentially, that you do for their InDesign. But good question. 